be in the house of the Lord today. What an awesome privilege to be alive, to be of sound mind. Oh my God. We give him thanks, we give him praise. And um, I just want to just ask the Lord this morning just to bless this word that's about to come forth. Ask that it would be anointed and it will come out the way that he wants it to come out because it's his word that these lips will just be as clay that he can use and, and, and change and do whatever he wants to do with. Lord God, I commit this word to you, your word. And I ask that you use it, Lord God, anoint it first of all, and that you you would send it, Lord God, to the hearts of the hearers, Lord God, with the anointing on it, to accomplish what you want to accomplish, Lord God, to their hearts, to my heart. And Father God, let your word not return unto you, Lord, Lord God, but let it do the work that you want to do this morning, Lord Jesus. You said that your, your word is like a mirror, we look into it. And when we look into it, Lord God, we cannot walk away from it because we see, Lord Jesus, ourselves. You show us ourselves and you show us our need for you. And Lord God, we just ask, oh God, that this morning as we look into your word, your word will change us and make us into the people that we ought to be. Lord, a people that will give you praise and honor and glory on this earth. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody say it. Amen. Okay, so. I was thinking about all of the celebration and all of the, you know, different things that have been happening this past week. On the 1st of August, we celebrated here in Jamaica, and I would imagine throughout the um, Caribbean islands and, and other places, we celebrated Emancipation Day. And then on the 6th of August, Jamaica celebrated its 59th independence from Britain. So, Emancipation Day. I, I wanted to see what that was all about. And, you know, this was not even something that started when I was here. I believe it started in 1997, being celebrated, commemorated here in Jamaica in 1997 with the then Prime Minister, um, who felt that it needed to be a, made a public holiday. It was celebrated before and then they stopped. So I looked up um, emancipation. What, what is that all about? It, that is a commemoration or a remembering of the abolition of slavery um, that started many years ago. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And, um, and I also, with, with welcoming in our, our guests today, I also want to welcome those who are watching. And I spoke with him yesterday and he said, yes, you can go ahead and, and welcome me publicly. And it's my, my cousin, Frankie, and also his wife, my cousin, Millie. He said, I'll be with you in church tomorrow, which is today, which they will hear this later. So I wanted to say a special welcome to you all and everybody else who is watching, as well as our visitors who just came in today. Good to have you. So talking today about freedom, actually, but I'll entitle that a different way later on. Talking about the fact that we just celebrated Emancipation Day on the 1st and Independence on the 6th of August. So I looked up um, what this emancipation was about, because I, I just heard about emancipation. I wanted to understand fully what this really means. Um, and there is, uh, this is a story of emancipation. I'm not really going to hold story, but I'm going to break it down, which is, this was a bill that was put forward back in, um, in, the, eight, in the 1900s. And it's, it says, August 1st, 1834, marked a special day for Africans in Britain, British colonists, rather. But I just put, put, a, put out a little part of it because part of what I'm going to talk about is based on, on a word that I saw in there. 
It says, be it enacted that all and every one of the persons who on the first day of August 1, 1800, 1800, August 1834, shall be holden, and this is Old English, so see if you can just, you know, don't be confused by the wording, shall be holden, shall be held in slavery within such British colony as a force as we talked about before, shall upon and from and after the said first day of August, 1834, become, that's the slave, become and be to all intents and purposes free and discharged from all manner of slavery and shall be absolutely and forever manumitted. And I said to myself, okay, what does manumitted mean? You've never heard that word before? Never, till just this week. Has anybody here ever heard that word, manumitted? Okay, so, and apparently it's used quite a bit too. Manumitted, what does that mean? Okay, so the Latin word, I don't know how many did Latin in school, I did it, it was one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> yeah, but for some reason I did really well in Latin, got a credit in Latin, of all things. A language that they say is a dead language, not spoken, but guess what, a lot of the English words go back to that, so that helped me quite a bit with my English. If I sat in an English exam, didn't recognize the word, I could look at the root of that word and figure out what it meant, and guess what, it was right. So, it, 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 it really paid off, it really paid off. So the Latin word, manus, M-A-N-U-S, sounds a lot like Spanish, mano, right? Manus means hand, and then mitere, M-I-T-T-E-R-E, -E, means to let go, to let go of the hand. So in other words, Manumitere, man, ma, manumitere, man, manus mitere, was to let go of somebody's hand. So manumitted here in this article meant that the slave that was bound in chains, that person was now going to be loosed. The, the slave owner or master would let go of the person's hand, meaning they would take the chains off and they would say, you're free to go, this is it. So, manumission, that really sparked something in me because we see a lot of those um, emblems and, and what have you on the social media, especially this week, where the, the slave's hands are like this and you see the chains being broken. We just had break every chain. and. Uh, I'm not here really this morning to talk about the slavery and what have you, and that, that we experienced, different ones experienced, different nations experienced. Um, Africans in, in British colonies, of course, received freedom from slavery back on Emancipation Day. And um, the thing about it, which really sparked an interest in me is that even though the chains were taken off and they were let go, yet they did not have full freedom at that time. Not full freedom. Anyone over the age of six would be an apprentice. I think you've heard that term before, an apprentice. That is, um, that person would work without pay for their former masters for three quarters of the week. Listen to this in exchange for lodging, food, and clothing, right? And they could also, if they wanted, they could also hire themselves out for the rest of the week, the quarter of the week remaining. And with that money, they would, they would save that money up to buy their freedom. Yes, they were manumitted. See, they were, they were free, but not totally free. So, you know, I look back at this and I'm thinking, hmm, it's a good 
wonderful thing to experience freedom from restrictions, from bondage imposed upon us by others, by a society, by a government, by a country. But there's another type of bondage that sometimes we don't realize exists, and that's a spiritual bondage. It's, it's one in which we are bound like this by sin. See, so many of us have been celebrating this past week emancipation, independence. It's a joyous occasion. But this type of bondage, spiritual bondage to sin, is worse than the physical bondage. This is worse, worse than Africans being enslaved. It's worse than the Jews being in, in Egypt. For all those years, it is a lot worse. And you say, how could it be worse? They were tortured, they were, you know, it, 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 how, how can you compare that? You see, we can be walking around without the chains, physical chains of slavery. And yet, we have no shackles on our hands or on our feet. We have no physical limitations because we're walking around and we are living life and we, we feel that we're living life to its fullest. So how can you say that I'm bound, really? How, how can that be? I'm gonna look at, and please look at it with me, to John chapter eight, starting with verse 30. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I'm so glad you can see it. Can you read it? No? Okay. Read along with us, okay? Read along with us. Okay, good. So let's let's read together. Starting at verse 30 in chapter 8. As he spake his word, many believe on him. Verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think that. Okay. We just have to always deal with the extra noise, don't we? <laughs> All right. So, verse 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. Verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? Free. You see, they were asking him before about himself. They wanted to know who he really was. And so he began to explain to them who he was. But, you know, it's, it's like he was trying to say, if you, you, you need to um, really listen to me. And many who, who heard that, thank God, believed on him. So, verse 33 says, They answered him, I'm not hearing anybody else but myself, they answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Okay, just pause a minute here. Does that make sense to you? We're there, the Jews are saying, We are Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. Does that make any sense? doesn't. That was not true. That was false, what they were saying, because Israel was in bondage in Egypt, right? 400 years they were in Egypt, in bondage. And so they maybe were trying to pull a fast one on Jesus there, but you know, Jesus, the word, already knew the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life, right? So in verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. 35, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Okay, so, 
I have never seen this before until just a few days ago. Never, never really seen it. When he talks about the Son right here. We know he's talking about Jesus, right? The Son of God here. But I'm going to read something to you, which is in my margin here. And this is the first time I'm really understanding this. You know, where it says, in okay, it says, servant of sin, okay. Where Jesus says, whosoever commits sin is a servant of sin. It says, no man can commit sin and not be a servant of sin. No man can sin and not have to pay the penalty for sin. There's a penalty that sin carries. Back in the garden, when Adam and Eve fell from grace and sinned, they were shut out of the garden. And sin entered into man's heart, right? And because of that, if you recall, he said, Adam, you're going to till the ground. You're going to sweat. The ground is not even going to give to you what it used to give to you. You're going to have to work even harder. By the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread. Eve, he said, because you sinned, right? When you're giving birth, oh boy. <laughs> the ladies are like, oh, Eve, why did you do that, Eve? When, you, when, when, you, when you're giving birth, that labor is going to be something else. It's going to be true labor. Adam was laboring, you're going to be laboring. <laughs> labor and delivery. You know, you're going to just be in so much pain and agony, right? And that's because of sin. So, sin carries a price with it, unfortunately. Um, and the scriptures tell us about how all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in Romans 3.23. Now I have to turn here, but the wages of sin is what? It's death. But the gift of God is eternal life, right? So sin, people might feel, well, I, I'm all right. I can go ahead and sin. There's nobody writing down anything, taking any account and say, oops, two sins today, oh, tomorrow three, oh, the next day five, they're adding up by the end of the week. Oh, my goodness. There's nobody doing that. <laughs> Guess what? There's a God that's watching. He's, he's seen. He sees everything we do. He sees, he hears and, and, and knows our thoughts even before we think them. Amazing, isn't it? Whether you, you have somebody watching you or not, physically, there's an all-seeing eye that's watching. So, and he says here, there is a penalty, right? For sin. Okay. All right. So, this is another part that is just very interesting to me, which I said before, I never really saw this. Verse 35 says, the, the servant, the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth hmm, ever. So, let's look at the breakdown here. It says, the servant of sin does not abide in the house of the Lord forever, but if we become free from the sin, from sin, we will abide with the Son of God in God's house forever. He goes on to say, if one is made free from sin by the Son, he is free indeed and is no longer a servant of sin. Listen to this. Very, very interesting. Greeks permitted a son, a son born to the parents, and ear, that's the son is the ear, is going to inherit everything from the parents. To adopt brothers, and Romans permitted him, the son, to, be, to free all slaves that were born in the house during the father's lifetime. So the son has been given the authority to free one of the other servants in the house. He has been, he's the heir of what his parents give him and the parents say, okay, you are, uh, give, you have been given the authority to give what I'm giving you to those in the household that are not sons. 
I've never ever seen this before in, in my entire life. Has anybody here ever seen it? So when the Bible tells us in verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I've never, never, ever seen that before. I always just saw, you know, for God so loved the world that he said what? His only begotten, that whosoever should not but have He sent his son, and we say, thank you, Lord, that you sent Jesus, your son. But never before have I ever seen this, where the custom back then was the son was given the authority to free those in the household. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, has been given the authority to free us Oh, I'm telling you, when I read that, I was like, whoo, really? My God, never saw this before. Oh, it is just amazing how God just works. He, he, he uses the, the, the physical things around us, you know, like when he did that with the parables, he would talk to the fishermen, he would use fish and loaves, things that they could relate to so that they would understand. So when he sent Jesus Christ, his son, <laughs> oh my God, to die for us, he knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. The spotless lamb of God knew no sin. But because of the fact that we could not pay the price for our sin, the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. He looks at it and is like, mm-mm. All of our righteousness, all of our good works don't even come up to anything in God's sight. They don't meet his, his righteous requirements, his righteous standard. And so he said, you know what? You're, you're in the house. You're not the son. But I'm going to send the son so that the son can release to you freedom. The Son can set you free because, as I read just now in the, in the, in the Roman household, in the Greek household, Greeks were permitted a son and heir. To, they permitted them to adopt brothers. Jesus has adopted us. Oh, we're adopted. But in the Roman household, the same Son was given the liberty, the authority. Only the son could do it. You know, you would say, okay, the father could do it too, but the father has given the, the, this, this inheritance to the son and the authority to say, you, you can go ahead. Free that one. And if you do that, if you say that, I have no trouble with it. I will accept that. You go ahead and you release that one, the one that you want to release. And aren't you glad this morning that when Jesus Christ came with the authority from the Father, that he had the power through his shed blood on Calvary to release us from sin. And, and, and you know, I'm talking about chains of sin, and people might be saying, really, what kind of chains? I don't feel bound. I don't feel bound at all. Why, why should I be considered bound? I'm, I'm moving along, I'm working, I have a family, I, I'm, I think my life is really nice right now. But you are bound if you don't know Jesus Christ. You are bound if you have not asked him to come into your heart and to set you free. Let's look at Ephesians chapter two and verse two. I'm gonna ask you to show this, not just the King James, but also the Amplified After. We've read the King James. 
version. Ephesians chapter 2. Okay. So it says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. This is talking about Satan, the prince of the power of the air. People don't believe that there is something else going on in the air that is causing people to walk in disobedience. That's Satan. They don't like to talk about stuff like that because they figure, no, 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 we won't go there. But believe it or not, it is happening. The Amplified Version, what does it say? You don't have the Amplified. And I was looking at the Amplified in on my own, which I might have to find. <laughs> But Amplified kind of um, gives us a little bit more um, pertaining to that so that we can understand that it's not, it's not just, well, you know, I can find that. If you can, I'll move on to another scripture and then come back to that one. Um, we don't have to put that up there, but it explains it in a little different light. Let's look at Proverbs in the meantime while he's checking that out for me. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 21 to 22. I'll just read that. Proverbs chapter 5. 21 and 22 it says for the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord and he pondereth all his goings verse 22 says his own iniquities shall take the wicked himself and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins cords chains yes 21 and 22 I just read that Okay, so in my margin, I looked at something here that I thought was very interesting. Coming back to that other one. Okay. Do you know when hunters actually set traps for animals and birds and what have you. Well, here, what is being explained in Proverbs is saying that traps are set by the enemy. When someone is tempted to sin, that's a part of the bait. Usually if you watch the movies and you see, you see, say they, I guess, different ones in the movies going by, they're walking or they're doing something. There's something that's pulling them in a certain direction. That's the bait. Satan throws out a bait and if we, which is temptation, the Bible talks about temptation, being tempted. If we follow that bait and we are tempted and we, we go in the direction of the temptation, eventually what happens, like those people in the movie, they throw something out there. What happens eventually? There's a trap later on. There's a snare. There's that um, type of equipment where, have you ever seen a fox or different animals that they, their foot gets caught in it? Well, that is exactly what Satan does. He throws out a snare. There's a temptation. There's that bait. And then finally, what happens is the person is trapped and is chained. Did you find anything? Okay, I just 
just yeah and I looked at it just this morning just this morning um, I'm gonna just try and put it in my phone here and see if I can pull up amplify the, the um, just that scripture John um, Ephesians 2 so please bear with me Ephesians 2 and verse 2 amplified Let's hope it's here. Okay, Ephesians 2. Okay, verse 2. In which you once walked. Okay. This says, in which you once walked. Um, is that how it starts? You were fallen the ways of this world, influenced by this present age, in accordance with the prince of the power of the air, in quotation, I'm sorry, in parenthesis, it has Satan, the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, in parenthesis, the unbelieving who fight against the purposes of God. So this same spirit, the satanic spirit, it's at work in disobedient, in the disobedient. And some people might feel, you know what? I don't sense anything pulling me anywhere. But because we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity, we are going to do things that are sinful. And the only way that that can be broken is by coming to Jesus Christ, the same son that is able to set us free. So my my main scripture today is whom the son had set free in verse 36 of john chapter 8 if the son therefore shall make you free you shall be free indeed nobody else is going to be able to do that nobody else can set us free only jesus christ and you know i was thinking that um some people when they were set free back in 1834 they had lived that way for so long that guess what they did not know what to do when the chains were taken off their hands they're like okay and they were like this i have lived that way for so long i, I mentally i'm not even prepared for freedom what is freedom some of them were born into slavery so how, 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 I don't know if I even know what to do with this here. Some of them, of course, became apprentices, as you know, and in, in the very beginning there with emancipation, later on with independence, they're, they're, it's like, how do I go back out into society? How, 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 how do I act free? How, how, what is that? And so when people hear the gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, even though some of us have grasped that and we understand that we needed a savior and we needed to be freed, they still haven't quite got to that place yet where they understand that there's freedom being given. They're still walking with the chains like this on their spiritual hands. No, not physical now. Their lives, are, they're still bound. Their hands and their feet are shackled spiritually, and yet they're moving around. They don't even realize that, wow, I don't have to be like this. The sun can set me free. I don't have to be in this house all the time, this, this life that I'm living. I don't have to be like this. But they're so used to the mentality that, wow, I don't know any better, and this is it. This is it. I've accepted it. But I believe the Lord wants us this morning to understand. And this has been preached over and over and over again. It has been preached from mountaintop to the Lois Valley. It has been preached. It has been preached all over this world. That God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. 
It has been preached so often. It has been preached with such passion. And yet, people go around still bound, still chained, and don't even understand that they're still slaves, slaves to sin. And I know there was a verse that I read earlier on that said, he who sins is a slave to sin. That's something that people might say, you know what? I know I'm doing this thing. It feels good to me to take a life or to do something that is just horrible. It feels good. But you're telling me now that that thing is my master? I don't think so. I feel I can do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. But now what does the Bible say? And this is the word of God, which is truth. It says, if we do sin, then we become slaves to the sin. My God. My God. Oh, I tell you what, if, if we could understand that Jesus Christ, the Son, has come to set us free and to lose us, man, just like on the day of emancipation and Independence Day when they were jumping up and, and they, they had so many things going on, feasts of all sorts and music and big celebration, if only mankind would understand that Jesus Christ has come and he has emancipated us. Mani Materi, he has taken the shackles off. When we come to him and we say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I ask that you come into my heart and make me your child. Those chains fall off. And we don't become apprentices either. It's complete freedom. When it says that the Son, if it says, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free, how? Partially, temporarily, you become apprentices, you shall be free indeed. Stamped. It's approved. It's, 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 it's final. This is it. You don't have to, you don't have to do anything else. We cannot do anything else. We cannot add to the finished work on Calvary. When Jesus Christ said, it is finished, he meant that. Because he knew that he was going to die. He knew that he would be resurrected. And he knew that nothing else apart from the shedding of his blood would bring remission of sins, would grant us the pardon, would grant us the freedom, nothing else. So I stand here today just to, just to say that there is a freedom that goes far beyond what we have gone through with emancipation and independence. And thank God for those things. Thank God for the heroes who gave their lives for freedom. But thank God for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for you, 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 and me. Thank God for him. And thank God that the shackles truly can fall off our lives when we come to him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I pray somebody got something out of this. And if you have shackles, if you're bound, you're going through some things, you don't know the Lord, I pray that you will come to him and that you'll say, Lord Jesus, break these shackles off me. I give myself to you right now as your child. Wash me, cleanse me in the precious blood of the Lamb right now. Jesus. understanding of what freedom 
in Christ really is what it really means. Freedom in Christ means that when we come to him and we've accepted him, that all of our sins have been washed away. The sins that, as man, we tend to gravitate to, right? Because that's what we were born in, right? When Adam, you know, when that happened in, in, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, sin came upon man. And the only time that it would, would, was, was removed was when, we, when God brought into this world his son and his son allowed us, gave us the opportunity to be free from that sin yes. when we accept him as Christ. You know, when she was speaking, I was thinking about the, the basics of what she was talking about, the sin and the bondage and the chains that, we, that holds on to us when we sin, right? When we do things that are not good in His sight, right? We can think of theft, stealing. We can steal that item from this person or from that, that person. And we think we're, we're okay. We think it's good. But deep down, that thing will always hold be in the back of our mind, right? As human beings, we'll know wrong from who good from wrong, right? And it'll always be haunting us to know that 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 person we did that that to that person, and that's the that's the bondage, that's the chain that's always holding on to us, and all the things that we might have created and done in our lives, that's always going to be behind in the back of our minds, right? And that's the only way we can release, be released from that bondage is through Christ, Jesus Christ, through accepting Him, accepting Him as Savior. Lord God, we just ask you, Father God, that as we ponder on these things, Lord God, ponder on this thing, Father God, today, and we consider what our ancestors, our forefathers, have been released from, and we think about what God did for this world by sending His Son so that we can be free, so that we can be free from sin, simplify accepting Him into our hearts, that He will forgive us and never even remember those sins once we've accepted. Our Heavenly Father will have forgiven and forgotten our sins. And we ask the Lord God that everyone that's here and everyone that's here, that it is their decision, Lord God, to come to you. Lord God, and ask you forgiveness, ask you for salvation, ask you to come to their hearts, Lord God, that they will be free from sin, free from the bondage, free from the chains, Lord God, that holds them back from everything that God has in store for us. We thank you, Lord God. We've asked you, Lord God, to help us to continue this walk, Lord God, in you. This continue this walk with you, Lord God. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't have to say what you hear that you know you can identify with what went forth. And if you are here and you're saying, you know what? I understand that without Christ I am bound. I have shackles on me and you'd like to give your heart to the Lord. This is an opportunity that we're offering to do so. When I when I got saved, I was not in a church. I might have been visiting a church. But I had Heard, of, heard the word at every street corner here in Jamaica. Different place, people were on a box preaching and I just knew that Jesus Christ had come into this world to save sinners such as myself. And I knew it. I just knew it. It was just a knowing that I had. And I was not in a church. When I gave my heart to the Lord, I was at my bedside at home. And uh, You don't have to be in a church setting 
to do so. You just have to understand that Jesus is knocking on the, your heart's door and he's saying, it's time, it's time. Do you still want to remain shackled? Do you still want to continue living like that? Because you know in your heart of hearts, nobody has to tell you, you know exactly what is going on. And I was a teenager and yet I felt, I, I told the Lord, I said, I'm not running anymore, as if to say I'd lived a whole long life, and I hadn't. But I told him, I said, this is it, I'm not running anymore. I want you. So the opportunity is being given to you today to come to Jesus Christ. Thank you.